This is Under the Cross Swords, a podcast series from Mosquita Nautica. A Voyage by MFV by Jeff Huron. Introduction The following story took place more than half a century ago, and memory grows dim, but it seems useful to reflect on some of the changes which have taken place in the world since. The year 1954 was some 12 years or so after the major World War II sea and air battles in the Mediterranean. There were hundreds of sunken ships in harbours and under the sea, all of which would have carried bunker oil, ammunition and other pollutants. I remember an Italian salvage firm working on the ships in Benghazi Harbour, also a British company salvaging metal from the desert behind Tobruk, while expended landmines blew up spontaneously in the hills surrounding the port. Yet there seemed no real evidence of desecration of the beaches or the water. For us aboard the MFV 51, close to the water as we were, the sea was clear and pristine. The North African beaches we saw were clean white sand. On occasion we would hail a native dinghy and buy a fish to be prepared by an expert member of the crew for dinner. In recent years I understand the Mediterranean has become damaged by industrial and agricultural chemicals as well as oil leaks from tankers and other ships. Fish can be inedible in places. If true, this is a terrible price to pay for the benefits of modern civilization. In 1954, national service was in full swing, and apart from this simple fact, we young soldiers were quite unaware of politics or world events generally. Whether regulars or national service men, we were blissfully ignorant of the machinations which placed us where we were. It is perhaps worth noting that the period from 1951 to 1955 in Egypt is not one which has been much recounted by the historians, nor was it beloved of the politicians. It took more than 50 years to recognise that era with the striking of a Canal Zone medal, by which time most of the participants would have either passed away or have lost interest. I feel privileged to write this bit of history, to have again been in contact with Biff Fricker, known to us as Badge, through the agency of the internet, was a joy. It was an honour to serve as his best man at the wedding of he and Pearl at Waltham Abbey in 1955. Sadly, he has since passed away, but I continue to communicate with his son Dave on matters maritime. He maintains an encyclopaedic interest in War Department ships and histories, and it was he who came up with the idea of writing this record. If a dedication is appropriate, it must be to every one of those who took part in this story. After all this time, I hope there may be some who will read this and correct the many errors of fact I have no doubt made. Number One Island to Gibraltar At the end of 1954, Britain had finally agreed to leave the Suez Canal Zone in Egypt. Colonels Negwib and Nasser had negotiated the repatriation of the canal, probably the main earner of international income in the country, to be operated as it had been since 1885 by the Compagnie Universelle du Canal Maritime de Suez. Since Britain was no longer so dependent on the canal for transits to India and the Far East, and continued occupation to maintain the neutrality of the canal zone was expensive, political expediency was satisfied. At the time there were said to be some 80,000 troops in the canal zone, probably very few of them even aware of the seismic events happening worldwide. The transistor radio was invented, the Miss America pageant was broadcast on television, the TV dinner was introduced amongst other wondrous things, and the Battle of Dien Bien Vu determined the end of French occupation of Vietnam. Less well known were the activities of a small band of intrepid seamen occupying part of a small island at the north end of the Suez Canal on the east side of Port Said Harbour, close to the town of Port Fouad. This unlikely group, part of the British Army of Occupation, 
rejoiced in the name the 48th Company Royal Army Service Corps Water Transport. Contrary to what you might expect, the name referred not to a capacity to transport water, but to transport almost anything else by water. To play this remarkable role, the Army had seen fit to train soldiers as seamen, navigators, marine engineers and other specialists to operate a range of vessels from landing craft to harbour launches, patrol boats to high speed launches and anything else that could float and play a useful role for the Army. Some three years earlier, riots in Cairo and Port Said had led to a general strike by Egyptian port workers in an attempt to close the canal. As a result, the 48 company had been urgently reinforced with a number of additional seamen and marine engineers from the training company at the Isle of Wight to support the operation of Port Said Harbour and the canal. Many of these new arrivals were national servicemen, most of whom had some previous marine experience. There were ex-Thames lightermen, ex-fishermen, even sons of yachtsmen and navy commanders. I had arrived in January 1952 as an ex-merchant navy apprentice, then as a private soldier with a blue ensign and cross swords flash on my sleeve and a fancy lanyard around my shoulder. Now three years later, I was a regular sergeant with experience in several types of vessel in Port Said, Fanara and Adabaya in Egypt and in Benghazi, Libya. But those three years are another story. Back to 1954. In early November of that year, my detachment and I had been recalled from Adabaya in Suez Bay to our operational headquarters at Number One Island. Berth there were four or five river-class fast launches. The names of these, if I recall correctly, were the fast launches Char, Dart, D and Derwent. There was also a flotilla of harbour launches, two motor fishing vessels returned from Benghazi, and ashore a boat store, marine workshop, slips and cradles, and all those bits and pieces required to operate a small fleet. It had been decided, I believe, to hand over the harbour launches to the Egyptian port authorities. To create up the fast launches and transport them by ship to the UK, and as for the MFEs, well, that's where I first met Badge. Obviously that was not his real name. He was a sergeant like me, but five years older and more experienced in War Department boats, including landing craft and MFEs. Both of us had previously served, separately, aboard MFE 51 in Benghazi. And now we were to serve again, this time as skipper and mate. So Sergeant Maurice Fricker and I began to prepare for a voyage of a lifetime to the UK by motor fishing vessel. Our chief engineer was Staff Sergeant Keith Hopping, naturally known as Hoppy. The rest of the crew comprised, I think, three seamen and a second engineer. The total of seven was limited by the fact that although the MFEs had fairly capacious holds, the crew accommodation provided only the skipper's cabin and six bunks below deck after the engine room. The second MFE was 221. Remarkably, I can't recall the crew of the 221 at all. In fact, my memory for names has faded considerably over the years, so if any ex-water transport soldier who was part of this adventure should read this and wonder why his name was not mentioned, I apologise abjectly in advance. A word about these sturdy vessels. They were 62.5 feet overall, built solidly of oak and other hard timbers, with round bilge, a vertical stem post and canoe stern. The crew quarters were in the stern, with access from the deck via a companionway on the starboard side. The bunks and seats formed a half circle facing a small galley with paraffin stove and a Dutch oven. A door at the forward end of the compartment led into the engine room and to a marine toilet on the port side. The superstructure comprised the wheelhouse with the skipper's cabin and coach roof astern, 
with a wooden locker for the storage of flour, canned foods, etc. Above the wheelhouse and cabin, there was an open navigation deck, which in the Merchant Navy would be called the Monkey Island, and which boasted a chart storage box with lid and a bearing compass. Below and immediately aft of the hold, power was provided by a six-cylinder Kelvin engine, turning a right-hand screw capable of pushing the boat to a comfortable, if not impressive, cruising speed of six knots or so. MFE 51 was built in 1943 by Johnson and Jago at Lee-on-Sea and began service as a Navy fireboat in the Mediterranean that same year. She was handed over to the Army at Alexandria sometime before 1946. Eventually, the two boats departed from Number One Island and sailed north out of Port Said's outer harbour. The statue of de Lesseps pointing south was on our port beam as we entered a kindly Mediterranean sea. We nodded our way through a low swell, the sun shining and the engine smoothly pounding. Watches were assigned by Skipper Badge. Charts marked up and cooking rosters agreed. As the old expression has it, this was Daddy's yacht. Left behind were the bustle and smells of Port Said Harbour, its bumboats and transiting ships, and a sense of purpose and excitement could be felt, as well as the clean salt air blowing from a dark blue sea. This, it should be remembered, was before the days of GPS, telephony, decker navigators, or any other such refinements. We navigated largely by dead reckoning, or deduced reckoning, supplemented by bearings on headlands and the few lights operating ashore. The walker's patent log was streamed, bearings taken, and we were outward bound for Malta. The course to Malta took us along the North African coast in a generally west-northwesterly direction, for a distance of about 900 nautical miles. Wind and weather were favourable all the way, so that the voyage was completed in six days. Arrival, I believe, was in mid to late November 1954. To ports were places familiar to us from operating out of Benghazi, particularly the towns of Derna and Tobruk. The weather remained fair, the night sky was bright with stars and the sea friendly. Conditions on board were agreeable for most of us. We were, after all, experienced MFE crew. The food was better than in the average NAFI, thanks to the training by Sergeant Thomas of the Galley Cooking School. The voyage was to be relatively short, so watches of four hours on and four hours off did not become too onerous. The only unpleasant thing was the smell of burnt diesel which drifted from the wet exhaust whenever the wind blew in the right, or rather, the wrong direction. Somewhere out of Crete, the engine stopped. My immediate thought was how pleasant life could be without the noise and the smell, followed by the realisation that this could be serious. Hoppy swung down into the engine room to report with a series of suitable epithets that this was going to take some considerable time. The stories then began to flow about that trip when we had to hoist the sails, live on canned sardines, speed was no more than one and a half knots and then the engine started up again and we were once more beating through the water at a familiar six knots. And so we glided smoothly into Valletta Harbour and then into the Slima Creek where we tied up between the boys. Badge left to perform some administrative task, while the rest of us lounged around getting used to the steady deck. We probably looked a bit scruffy, with unshaven chins and creased coveralls, so we were a touch disconcerted when a really tiddly navy launch puttered around the stern and stopped almost alongside. A most important looking personage in civilian clothes asked most politely who we were and from whence we had come. I explained how we were delivering the boats to the UK from Egypt, and that we were to refit in Malta. He thanked me, and then the Admiral's barge, for that's what it was, drifted off to the nearby harbour wall, 
and Lord Mountbatten disembarked. He was Commander-in-Chief Middle East at the time, and most Sundays got away for some scuba diving, thus he took some interest in this unusual craft close to his landing place. So much so that we later learned that both boats were to be fitted with radios, and some of us trained to operate them for reasons of safety during the rest of the voyage, I believe at Lord Mountbatten's behest. Badge returned to advise that the expedition was to be joined by Captain Edwards from the training company, and that he would be accommodated aboard the 221. We would continue with the same crew, and that it would take about six weeks for the boats to be refitted at the Milan Brothers yard in Peter Creek. And so it was. Badge and I, and two from the 221, were detailed to attend a radio operator's class run by the Sparks aboard the Royal Fleet Auxiliary ship, berthed in Valletta Harbour. As the boats were slipped, we were given comparatively luxurious accommodation ashore in what appeared to be an old stone fort. Army iron bedsteads were a step up from the MFE bunks. Occasionally, Badge and I would visit the slips to see how MFE 51 was coming along. I remember specifically that some copper sheathing had to be refixed to the hull, and that at least one strake had to be replaced. The engine was overhauled, the anchor cable flaked and checked, and the rudder and propeller maintained. We were in Malta for about six weeks. Badge and I attended our radio lessons aboard the RFA ship. Each morning we were ferried from the dock to the ship by launch, and then spent an hour or two looking at a puzzling array of dials and switches, and, at least on my part, pretending to understand what they were for. Teaching time comprised an exchange of sea stories and a recommendation that we practice our Morse code in our spare time. As it turned out, the radios that were ultimately fitted were a totally different and much older model, but more on that later. All hands, with the notable exception of Badge, spent some time visiting Straight Street, popularly known as The Gut, to experience its bars, booze and beauties. That soon polled, however, and other pursuits became more attractive. I remember a Sunday when Badge and I found ourselves on the edge of a huge square in front of the Cathedral of St John in Valletta. There was a festival in progress, in which a huge procession of clerics and others carrying crosses, images and icons wound its way around the cathedral walls. On occasion, the line of people would stop, and an immense cacophony of sound from fireworks, cymbals and rattles emanated from the cathedral roof. We were told later that the objective was to drive any devils out of the building and to keep them out with the religious symbolism of the procession. On another occasion, we were invited to watch a trooping of the colours by the 45th Marine Commando. I believe it was Lord Mountbatten who took the salute. It was a most impressive display, but I think Badge and I were glad we were sailors and not square-bashing soldiers. A less impressive memory is of my introduction to Scotch and Dry, for which I blame Badge. Apparently this was a favourite drink of his, but I found, after several tries, that it disagreed with my sense of balance and ability to see straight. I've never tried that particular mixture since. At last our day of departure was determined. The boats had been fumigated and still retained some of the smell of the gas. The new paint looked smart, and after a little extra work holystoning the decks, we were shipshape and Bristol fashion. We were visited by a few notables, including Badge's sister, Pat, who came aboard to say goodbye. She was a commissioned military nurse serving in Malta Garrison and is partly thanks to a letter from her that we can establish that the date of our departure was the 13th of January 1955. The weather and the forecast were both set fair, a fact supported by Pat's letter. And we set sail around the north side of the island, having laid a course for a point off Cape Bon and parallel with the southwest coast of Sicily. We had almost cleared the island of Gozo when a storm of great ferocity came up from the south southwest off the deserts of Tunisia and Libya. I had experienced one of these Ghiblis, 
as they are known in Libya, some years before in Benghazi. They can arise in minutes and can subside as quickly two or three days later. We have no choice but to shelter in the lee of Gozo until it has blown itself out. MFVs are safe in a heavy sea, based as they are on the fishing boats of the North Sea, but they are not comfortable. We were tossed around like corks in a bathtub for nearly three days. It was impossible to cook anything or to do much but hang on to the wheel or the handrails. Water, both fresh and salt, got into everything. Both radios proved to be inoperative, although I doubt we could have made them work anyway. They were huge things and probably would have served a better purpose as boat anchors. A reasonable question in view of today's expectations was, why didn't we return to the safety of Letter Harbour? I believe the answer would have been twofold. To have turned beam on in that sea would have risked broaching, and after the storm had cleared, we were in good condition, and an ignominious return to port would have been unthinkable. Time went on, and suddenly the sky cleared, and the short drop of the Mediterranean moderated, and we made for Cape Bon, some 150 miles away. We passed the island of Pantelleria at night. Both Badge and I had seen and photographed the island on previous trips and boats. The most significant feature is Lion Rock, a formation reminiscent of the Lion of Singapore. Next day I remember awakening to a shining morning, grateful to find that both boats were at anchor in the lee of Cape Bon, in a couple of fathoms of clear water on a sandy bottom. Badge must have piloted the boat into this idyllic anchorage after 4am when I went off watch. We washed down the paintwork, dried our clothes and bedding in the warm sun and were ready to sail again in perfect conditions in just a few hours. In the month of January, the water was a touch cold, so there was little enthusiasm for swimming. Under orders from Captain Edwards, we weighed anchor the next day to round the Cape and lay a course for the next port of call. I began to realise that this second half of our voyage may well have been seen as a pleasant cruise by the good captain, an opportunity to visit some interesting ports and generally to enjoy a few days away from the office. Be that as it may, the next memorable event happened that afternoon as we were cruising along the Tunisian coast with 221 well ahead of us. Over the horizon, a frigate of the French Navy quickly overhauled us and began signalling from some distance off. The signal was in French and since I was the only one of the crew with a smattering of the language, I found the Aldi's lamp and attempted to respond to the question, quel bateau Êtes-vous? or something like that. Within minutes she was practically alongside and by loud hailer instructed us to follow. We were a bit slow for her so she had to swing round a few times to stay with us but eventually we were entering the French naval port of Bizerta. Soon we were alongside the quay and Badge went aboard the frigate with Captain Edwards to find out what sort of trouble we were in. Apparently the storm we had experienced and the lack of communication via our radios had started a bit of a panic ashore and the navies based in the Mediterranean had been alerted to look out for us. It must have taken some time to assure the authorities in Malta of our health and safety which gave us a few pleasant days alongside at this pretty little town. The Tunisian town of Bizerta is still the most important French naval port in the Mediterranean. It occupies a position in the narrowest part of the sea, being 714 miles east of Gibraltar, 1,168 miles west-northwest of Port Said, and 240 miles northwest of Malta. As a naval port, it was, and I suppose still is, well supplied with bars and other places of amusement for those ashore with money. Unfortunately, we were without money of any kind until some enterprising member of the crew discovered that there was a market for tins of army jam and pepper. Hard to believe, but the sale of a few of our stores to some Arabs supplied enough of the necessary for an evening ashore. 
A few of us were soon enjoying a beer or something similar in a bar crowded with French foreign legionnaires, all determined to have a raucous good time. After months in the desert, they were fairly thirsty and happy to meet some other soldiers. In spite of the music and general noise, a couple of drinks made it possible to communicate in several languages with no difficulty at all. Among Badge's memorabilia, there is a card for Bar Le Ré d'Or, Avenue de Algiers, Bizert, which serves to confirm my memory of that time. We were sorry to leave Bizerta. The money had run out, so there was little point in staying. A few days later, we were on our way with the blessings of the powers that be. Next stop, Delis in Algeria. I don't believe this was a scheduled stop. I'm not sure why we stopped at Delis. At about 300 nautical miles, or a little more than two days sailing from Bizerta, perhaps it was a need for repairs or to top up fuel tanks. The weather had again worsened considerably, and it is more than probable that a sheltered port was a good idea. Badge was a great collector of memorabilia from these places, and there are two tickets printed Cinema Palace, Delis, which suggests we were there long enough to see a movie. After Delis, we made a stop at Algiers, although my memory of this seems to have faded considerably. I do remember the cliff of white buildings climbing the hill on the west side of the harbour and that the town held little attraction for squaddies intent on getting their small ship back to Blighty. Less than 240 nautical miles west we entered the harbour of Mostaganem, which may well confirm that the weather was proving to be a problem. What is most memorable is the entrance to the harbour and our negotiating of it. By this time there was a short swell offshore which caused a heavy roll. Outside the harbour there is a long mole from southwest to northeast, so that it was necessary to turn to port with the swell abeam. As the 221 approached the end of the mole, it was evident that the swell was increasing and there were some breaking waves. As she made the turn, she rolled to such an extent that we could almost see her keel. She seemed to hang there for a long moment, then she disappeared behind the mole, writing herself. Then it was our turn. As I recall, Badge was at the wheel, while I stood to the starboard of the wheelhouse, holding on to the handrail. As we made the same manoeuvre, I literally found myself hanging over the blue water. She righted herself and all was well, but I'll never forget that moment. There was little to do in Mostaganem. It was a dusty old town at the time, although the people seemed friendly. After Mostaganem, there were only a couple of days sailing to Gibraltar, our next planned stop. I had hoped that we would put into port in Morocco in the belief that it would be more interesting than the towns in Algeria. The weather was worsening and it was decided to make straight for Gibraltar and its protected harbour. I believe we arrived in Gibraltar in early February 1955, which makes it about three and a half months after leaving Port Said. In reconstructing the voyage, I find it hard to believe that it took that long, but there is proof in that among Badge's memorabilia are Naval Trust cinema tickets dated the 6th and 7th of that month. After a few days, we were anxious to be on our way to the UK via Lisbon, ports in Spain and the Bay of Biscay but it was not to be. The authorities decided that the voyage must end in Gibraltar and it would hand over the boats to the water transport company based there. This created some anxiety on our part that, if we were to not continue, we wished to be flown to Blighty as soon as possible. This turned out to be difficult, and here I quote from Badge's recollection. When servicemen were taken to Jib, normally by air, B.E.A., a return flight to the UK was booked for you. Obviously we were going to sail to the UK and having to hand over the vessels, no return flights had been able to be booked. So we had great difficulty in arranging our onward passage from Jib. Eventually we came across an RE Movements captain. He remembered me from our Abadiah days 
After many weeks, he eventually managed to obtain some flights for us on an RAF Coastal Command aircraft, which took us back to Lynham, Wiltshire. According to my paybook, I left Gibraltar and the Middle East Land Forces on the 3rd of March 1955. I remember lying with others on our kit bags in the fuselage of some sort of cargo plane, suffering the tremendous noise of the engines. In my kit bag, and I assume in others, there was a brand new duffel coat and a pair of sea boots, which had been issued prior to the voyage, and which I was most reluctant to leave aboard for someone else to enjoy. These items proved most useful back on the Isle of Wight. I believe we were all disappointed that we could not complete the voyage to the UK. My understanding of the decision was that it was due to the bad weather already experienced, and to some extent expected especially in the Bay of Biscay. There could also have been some political impact, insofar as relations with Spain were not amicable at the time. Badge, as skipper of MFV 51, remained as shipkeeper until his own departure, which must have been on or after the 18th of March. So that ended a voyage which I believe, for both Badge and I, marks a high point in our times as seagoing soldiers. I believe Hoppy and the rest of the crews felt the same way. We had all experienced interesting times throughout the Middle East and elsewhere on various kinds of craft and in good and bad conditions. So we were capable and competent to take on this particular task and it was done without damage or drama. After extended disembarkation leave, we were posted to the training company at Freshwater Isle of Wight. I was assigned as an instructor in seamanship and navigation at the school based at Fort Victoria, and Badge was assigned to oversee the harbour at Yarmouth, based aboard the barge Arctic 2. Hoppy became an instructor in marine engineering, but as for the rest of the group, I'm afraid I lost track. This I do regret. A brief history of MFV 51. MFV 51 was ordered in 1942 in a batch of MFVs, numbers 21 to 60 inclusive, from Johnson and Jago at Leon C. She was completed in May 1943 and conducted sea trials on the 31st of May. She was fitted with a Kelvin K4 diesel, number 21239. On the 14th of June 1943, the vessel sailed from Sheerness in coastal convoy CW186. At Shoreham, she was allocated by the Admiralty for naval service in the Mediterranean and was sent to Plymouth for assembly with the next convoy to the Med. Thus, on the 16th of June 1943, their lordships issued SBA 1847-6, stating MFV 51, with MFVs 26, 36, 45, 55, 57, 70, 105, 109, and 157 were allocated for service abroad. It was established that her service would be in the Levant, together with four other MFVs as a fireboat. She arrived at Alexandria via Algiers, Bone, Malta, Benghazi and Tobruk in August of 1943. In September she was assigned to HMS Prometheus for service on the Nile and by February 1946, it is reported that she was still based in Alexandria. In a reduction of craft after the war, it was reported by the Commander-in-Chief Mediterranean that there was no further requirement for MFE 51 as fitted, and she was transferred to the Army authorities for use in fire security and war department cargoes at Alexandria. How long she remained at Alexandria is not known. What is known is that she served as a coastal cargo vessel with the RESC crews between the Benghazi, Derna, Tobruk and Malta garrisons from about 1951 to 1954, when she was delivered to 4A Co- Company RESC water transport at Number One Island, Port Said, for transit to UK after the evacuation of the canal zone in November 1954. She was delivered by 82 Company RESC Water Transport in Gibraltar, as related in this story, in March 1955. She was still in service in Gibraltar in July 1961, 
when records show that she had been slipped for repairs in that month. In August 1962, she was again slipped for repairs at Gibraltar. The last entry on her data card was 3rd of September 1962, which date is thought to be the date of her survey and probably the time of decommissioning. No further information is available. This was extracted from the Small Craft Group Journal, number 32. Thanks for listening to this podcast episode from Mosquito Nautica. If you like the show and want to know more, check us out on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. Please leave us a review on whichever podcast app you use. We'll be regularly releasing content, so if you subscribe you'll get the updates and won't miss out. Thanks very much. Catch you next time.